clever Christmas present. So, trying new video format, yet another video format. Um, hopefully this works out and I stick with it because <laughs> it's finding it difficult to, uh, to find something that I'm happy with. Um, but yeah, hopefully this is it. So this video is going to cover the sort of a early philosophic foundations of liberalism and how it's married to capitalism um, and how that marriage undermines the the sort of goals of of liberalism, the, the rhetorical ideological goals and um, and yeah it's gonna it's gonna sort of lay the foundation the basis for the next few videos that I got planned. So to start with um, definition of socialism um, would be the emancipation of people from um, the compulsion of capitalist competition and to my mind this sort of implies a um, something similar to liberalism in that it um, frees the human subject from that compulsion and the imposition of having to negotiate the a capitalist society and to negotiate their their individual person through that capitalist society. This sort of sounds like um, John Stuart Mill's harm principle, which um, goes something like the only freedom which deserves the name is that of pursuing our own good uh, in our own way so long as we don't attempt to deprive others of theirs or impede their efforts to obtain it. In other words, this is um, this harm principle is uh, as if to say, um, be sound, um, you know, uh, leave other people, do, do what you, you should, you act in a way that, as if you were free, a free individual, as long as you're not um, depriving others of that freedom also. So it sounds similar to sort of human emancipation, uh, freedom. I mean, both socialism and liberalism come out of the Enlightenment period. Um, and uh, as a kickback of, against medieval institutions. But there's a gulf in quality um, between these two sort of stances, this, these positions. And one of the one of the sort of the key points is that Mill's philosophy, how it sort of manifests historically, um, ignores it ignores the context, the social context that people find themselves in, the capacity for them to act um, in pursuing their own good, in defining their own good, even and. Um, and it ignores the sort of the possibility of it doesn't go far enough to address the possibility of people acting in their own way for their own good uh, impeding others in doing so so this ignoring of uh, the context um, you can imagine if you think of the sort of uh, the developments of bourgeois society in feudal Europe how individual liberty um, would have been sought as a kickback, like I said, against the aristocracy and um, feudal institutions. Yeah, you could also imagine how um, this developing bourgeois society was made itself distinct um, in contrast to uh, peasantry and rural uh, lifestyles, particularly when the those peasants were displaced from their land and um, came to the urban centres uh, in search of wage labour. And in, um, in sort of being displaced from their land and their communities, um, possibly their families, peasants sort of flocking to those urban centres early 
early modern Europe. Um, I would imagine that, that they would have been in quite vulnerable situations, uh, particularly being at the butt of, of the sort of the, the conditions of wage labour when working in factories and probably not making very much even at that and um, having to rely on one another uh, to survive and for the bourgeois who were developing their self-awareness and sense of self um, would have would have disdained against or disdained of this uh, this dependence when their sort of whole MO was was independence and um, and you see this sort of disdain um, dependence versus independence uh, would have I assume been a sort of a like a, a bed a fertile bed for for the seeds of like um, that irrational hatred of other that we see today uh, the hatred of vulnerability and and class disdain and snobbery um, yeah it's so prevalent today and it seems to sort of assume that um, that the bourgeois lifestyle uh, was open to all and that um, and that the burgeoning working class just you know were disinterested <laughs> rather than unable to avail of that lifestyle. And uh, with all that, you can sort of imagine how um, the bourgeois liberal ideology of individualism is instituted um, historically uh, through this disdain and practice and how, um, how it came to be that um, people was so dismissive of atmospheric or ambient factors and conditioning people's circumstances, ignoring the social factors that um, that sort of inhibit or, well, or structure, inhibit or enhance people's ability to um, to operate their individuality. And this dismissal um, puts a total, like a total responsibility on the individual. Um, for themselves and leads to the idea that everyone's given situation is a matter of a matter of choice rather than circumstance and so uh, thinking thinking back again of um, of this bourgeois society kicking back against the aristocracy because of the sort of empowerment through capitalism and independence that increased wealth afforded them uh, this led to the the bourgeois revolutions in the name of democracy and and in this situation, capitalism and democracy and liberalism and bourgeois democracy, of course, um, all become infused. And it sort of enhances the view that, or the argument that in real time, as this is all played out, with the, with the peasants coming to, or the displaced peasants, the burgeoning working class coming to those urban centers, um, they just wouldn't have, they just wouldn't have, embodied this this sense of the free human liberal individual independent wealthy educated individual that was coming to define the new human definition of humanity of, of the human subject um, in early modernity and this perspective is illustrated through the ages um, 17th century John Locke's uh, theory of property um, he stated that God gave all land, all men equally, but did not endow men with the equal capacity to enhance that land, um, to enhance its productive efforts. And it was upon this capacity that man earned the right uh, to own that land, despite, <laughs> despite God giving it to everyone initially. Uh, equally um, so here we have Locke through his philosophy legitimizing um, 
the ownership over the means of productions uh, the means of production um, based on one's ability to do a capitalism on land uh, 19th century examples uh, can be found in Marx's Capital um, where he quotes industrialists factory owners um, sort of giving out about the idea that or making the argument that uh, their labour doesn't need uh, leisure time, free time they just need sort of the minimal amount of rest and social for social reproduction um, nourishment and um, their free time then would be best spent uh, in the factory and later in the 19th century we have uh, psychologists such as uh, Hippolyte and Gustave Le Bon arguing um, or expressing their disdain for crowds, forming their argument against the crowds, against um, what they described as the, the lowest rung on the ladder of civilization. Uh, they claimed that the aristocracy were less prone than the than the popular classes in in forming crowds, uh, arguing that crowds were pathologically irrational, um, demoralising to society, uh, as as demoralising to society as drunkards and women, and I think um, Le Bon was essentially sort of shaping his image through this philosophy of crowd psychology in the image of those um, uh, dependent vulnerable displaced peasants in early modernity and um, basically he's writing a tree a thesis uh, targeting poor people so we see this perspective carried through the 20th century um, when we're charting the rise of neoliberalism uh, neoliberalism was fashioned in the 30s by the likes of Frederick Hayek and Ludwig von Mises and they um, outlined a, a possessive individualism uh, where they where the individual is born with all that it needs uh, to get where it's going to get to in 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 its life in the world in society and um, ambient and atmospheric factors and society social factors just don't come into the equation in terms of what determines the outcomes of a given person's life in 1975 this perspective is displayed once more in Samuel Huntington's Crisis of Democracy where where he um, decries the, 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 the level of democracy that had been developing in the late 60s and early 70s through social movements uh, making demands in Crisis of Democracy Huntington um, essentially argues that groups lacking lacking the financial means um, and were associating collectively in order to make demands uh, were doing so democracy were doing so to the degree that it was impinging on uh, the ability of wealthy people to um, practice their their freedom um, and their liberty and this paper uh, featured at a um, conference of the Trilateral Commission in 1976 uh, both of which Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher were present they then went on to form successive governments in their respective countries the US and UK and um, where they set about instituting neoliberalism through both um, policy reform and uh, cultural reform the um, if you look at any sort of graph regarding income as an example, as one element of neoliberalism, uh, starting in the 80s, the, the inequality that had been reduced through social democracy um, rises steadily from their governments on through labour and democratic um, moments in government. It doesn't stop and hasn't stopped 
today. Um, but culturally, what they both set out to do, particularly, or well, I suppose Thatcher's more well known for it, at least on this side of the world, uh, is to sort of stamp out social solidarity. And social solidarity is the sort of belief that the um, through policy, capitalism can be regulated, that society can be attenuated to increase the sort of material um, security of the working class of vulnerable people. And in seeking to uh, merely regulate capitalism, it's by no means an anti-capitalist movement or philosophy. Nice. It does lay the normative foundations for social welfare and the social welfare system and um, you have Thatcher's famous declaration that society doesn't exist after which point uh, the social welfare system starts um, radically diminishing because of course uh, if there's no society there's no social factors uh, there's no ambient conditions that structure the the capacity of the individual to pursue their their own good in their own way and um, the groups then that formed associative uh, organization uh, to to leverage their position under under these conditions uh, we're not doing so out of necessity but out of uh, personal choice uh, under this perspective and we're therefore to be disdained of and uh, suppressed when the opportunity arose such as Thatcher's repressive uh, reaction to minor strikes and um, also under this perspective the Mills harm principle the and liberalism writ large it's a stark manifestation the the individual is assumed therefore to uh, all right to only ever cast a small net in terms of impact impacting others and um, you know, in terms of depriving others of their of their ability to to conduct their the pursuit of their own good in their own way, and um, and while this is of course true of of poor people, um, people who lack the means to sort of whose choices are you know can often be reduced to whether they get out of bed or not because of the the sort of the mental pressures of trying to operate you know three jobs to ensure that your family are fed and bills are paid on the other hand the impact that a CEO of a corporation that sees more economic turnover than many most countries and um, the impact the decisions this person makes are enormous surely uh, you know, on a global level. But if we're to be fair to these guys, um, you can imagine that it would be impossible in terms of the distance they have from the impacts of the choices they make for them to really acknowledge that impact. Uh, easy for them to to filter out the negatives and focus on the positives of generating wealth and jobs and the uh, the modicum of wealth distribution that their function performs and this is this is pursuing I mean they're pursuing their own good in their own way and they've gotten you know they've, they've happened to amass billions and, um, and and are impacting people negatively um, but they've gotten there through you know, bribing, manipulating, uh, the exercise of power, lobbying, and all of these, all of these practices are in the name of, you know, liberty, uh, bourgeois democracy, and, and capitalism. This is capitalism, is it not? Um, it's all in in the name of liberalism and Mill's philosophy. But what's more, um, liberalism hardly lends itself to an analysis of power, history and society focusing on the individual as it does and this sort of exacerbates further the, the inability for a liberal to really sort of comprehend 
the limits of Mill's harm principle when we consider the amount of power some individuals have amassed. And in this, um, Mill would excuse the CEO, no doubt, um, for while they're pursuing their good in their own way, um, they're not attempting to impede or deprive others from doing so. You know, it's not a conscious attempt, and this is crucial to liberalism, uh, to the freedom of liberalism, um, and how it's manifested historically. The, um, if we're not conscious, or if we can't conceive of an outcome, then how could we possibly legislate for it? Uh, particularly under possessive individualism. Um, the, what we conceive of socially is obviously quite limited. And in this, the, the sort of the most uh, efficient social system that you can derive is, that's a great half. Uh, the most efficient social system that you can derive is um, is for is, is to encourage the individual to to look after themselves and to not sort of worry too much about the plight of others, to use what resources they have um, at hand to buffer themselves from the accidental outcomes of the unintentional um, impact of others in terms of limiting or depriving them from their ability to pursue their own good. So we see here that like between Mill and the CEO uh, there's a tacit agreement uh, on limiting the role of ambient or atmospheric or social factors uh, in impacting the capacity of individuals. But if we take the logic of possessive individualism and apply it to an extreme um, we would, you know, the, the individual has all, if the individual has all or is born with all it, it needs, then there would be very little point in investing in the, in the care for infants. Um, but of course, no one argues against, against that. No one's that extreme. Uh, but the logic is applied to adults and this includes the capacity of many parents uh, to, to provide care for their children and um, that's, that's a, a real manifestation of this, of this perspective, perspective that um, argues that, that in the case of, of an adult who, who fails to, to foster their capacity to um, provide for their family and their, their children, um, <clears throat> that this failure is based on character and not circumstance, and it comes back to the choices. It's it's, it's choice oriented rather than uh, socially conditioned circumstances we find ourselves in. And of course, the same can be said for the the total care position, like the logic of um, considering the social. If this logic was taken to its extreme, um, society would be stifled and come to a standstill for for the bubble wrap we would all be the hype the metaphysical bubble wrap we'd all be enwrapped in and the lesson here is that um totalizing any logic into render society um in a ridiculous situation yeah given this here we are today witnessing the pursuit of uh, capital, a capitalism free from intervention fearing us ever further towards that totalizing extreme, that ridiculous outcome. We've got parents and adults unable to, oh, oh, oh muddy, unable to, to care for their children due to this, this, uh, um, this perspective. We've got elderly and infirmed uh, struggling also. And um, placing a personal rather than a social responsibility on care. And uh, this brings us to the private healthcare system and the privatization of public healthcare systems and, uh, and how they represent the essence of this absurdity. And returning once more to Mill's harm principle, 
um, and it's historic historically as it historically manifests um, on centering around the individual it effectively excuses the individual from considering others despite the second clause of the harm principle that is to say um, Mill's harm principle in conjunction with possessive individualism um, excuses the individual from considering other individuals in ignoring the, the social the social factors that uh, lead to it's 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 as if it rips up the connective tissue between cause of a powerful person and effect on vulnerable people. And in this, I suppose, um, the consideration of others then is, is seen as uh, an unnecessary burden. And that brings us to philanthropy, um, which the sort of early so early socialists would have been capitalist factory owners arguing for the betterment of or for better conditions for their workers you know to 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 put some sort of break on the competitive process of capitalism and i mean you get you get philanthropists today as well bill gates and um, through the ages from from robert owen to bill gates and all in between but the the point is that um that philanthropy is the personal choice to take on the burden of considering the plight of others it does not seek to alter the fundamental <coughs> philosophical underpinnings of our society uh, and, um, you know, enforce the idea that, that society it plays a, an important role in, in conditioning people's situation. It, it, it seeks to work within the parameters of possessive individualism. If we were to acknowledge the societal factors and the the material and position of people's powerful people's choices on vulnerable people and the idea that individuals lack the choice to deliver them um, any great distance from their starting point in life. Mill's harm principle is turned on its head. Um, when we do consider these material impositions and the effects societal um, factors uh, we can see that they affect people in in groups of people in very similar ways and in doing so uh, we can we can sort of come to identify groups um through through that lens uh, such as groups such as class and, and the reason that class is sort of is a is a contested concept we go back to that early feudal or uh, early um, bourgeois society developing from feudalism um and how, how kicking back against the aristocracy, the limits of medieval institutions, of the very particular vision of the individual, um, led to led to everything I've sort of outlined up to now, and um, and how the how the perspective fetishizes the individual because of those those social circumstances they found themselves in as they became aware. And how fetishizes the sort of the sanctity of the individual, and why that's such a strong, a strong aspect in our society, which is determined by powerful people. But if we had such a class perspective, um, or if one existed back then and was accepted, uh, we could we could have offered an alternative. Um, an alternative reason to, or a different reason to have an alternative um, perspective on those the, the displaced peasants that were coming to um, coming to the towns, the urban centres of early modern Europe. Before they were displaced, peasants worked the land uh, through a lease system, paying tithes to to their landlord, feudal lord the um, in produce or labor but through uh, through the development of a money rent system uh, in rural England the a, a lease market was created and um, some peasants were able to buy out others uh, offering higher rents to their lords for the leases and accumulated leases through more efficient production and uh, increasing their capacity to pay higher rents. The peasants that they displaced, their, their neighbours, their community, uh, 
they were rehired as farmhands and paid a paid obviously as, as low as the capitalist farmer could possibly pay them because they were in competition there for leases afraid that their accumulated leases would be bought out by a more efficient producer and of course they didn't need so many farmhands so many of the many of their neighbors they ended up having to go to the to the urban centers as I've already said and this is the division of labor that uh, the logic of capitalism starts starts instituting and with this division of labor we come to see or we can come to see if we're so inclined an entirely different nature or character of the of the displaced peasants coming to those urban centers that this is a this was not a choice that it was due to social factors that were out of their hands and it's this division of labor that um that leaves the displaced peasantry with uh, with nothing but their labor to sell in order to survive at all and um with so many uh, in this sudden situation uh, we're able to identify in a, in a material historic moment a class of people um, based on their relationship to the means of production as peasants they they were due to their lease they were free to work the land as much as they wanted and pay and whatever uh, tithe but the, me the means of production well didn't have ownership over it as such they did have control over it whereas uh, as labor that control over the means of production is thoroughly enhanced and their survival is based on the terms of the other class who do control the means of production and it's that relationship to the means of production that um that gives both classes uh, that singular characteristic that we're able to determine uh, and identify them as a class and uh, and with that we can return to mill's hand principle once more and instead of analyzing it and interpreting it through the lens of possessive individualism um or individualism at all we can examine it through the lens of class, where one class, as I just said, owns the means of production and grants access to it to the other class who has been disenfranchised of it and grant them access um, for a for an exorbitant fee. And the idea here is that the the individual with the control over the means of production has attained that control because of their mastery over resources and the generation of wealth. Um, and the idea is that it, in, under capitalism, society gives, if it exists at all, uh, gives the, um, that, grants that privilege uh, because it comes with enormous benefits to the masters of capital and resources and wealth generation and their ability to attain this mastery. Um, yeah, with, the idea is that they are the the custodians of the world's wealth and as a custodian they also they're I mean they're given like I said benefits the rights they also have a responsibility to um, distribute that wealth uh, to all others however that's the trickle-down effect of economics but the reality is that that fee I just mentioned is also known as surplus value and that is the idea that when a group of people make a bunch of products that they can sell at the market. The person who owns the means of production goes to sell it. So say their sale is a hundred fucking pence, whatever. Um, they return to the group of people uh, and pay them like a nominal fee of one penny each. Say there's 20 of them, that's 20p. And they made a profit of 80. Obviously, they only the means of production. They paid for the upkeep of that, uh, those tools, and say so that was another 20p. So 20p on labour, 20p on means of production. That's 40p, and um, they've made a profit of 60p. I mean, obviously, this is hypothetical, but like the profit is as big and as small as it is in reality, and considering the billionaires that keep popping up imagine it's quite big 
and this is surplus value and the accumulation of surplus value particularly if you've got more more people you're exploiting with such low nominal fees um, the more you're creating for yourself and uh, with that that accumulation of surplus value the gulf between the classes um, expands um, until one class is absolutely dominant over the other class despite the numbers and it's the case that even within the capitalist class uh, I mean competition still exists so there's winners and losers there as well and you know um, with every round of competition you've got less competitors as the losers drop out and uh, this leads to not only the gulf in inequality between the working class and the capitalist class but the concentration of wealth at the top of the capitalist class um, leading to monopolies uh, to colonialism and to war and of course when open conflict between powers does open up we get the situation that <laughs> even though it's between the, the top of the capitalist class it's the working class that gets pitted at the front every time so with that how do we reconcile bourgeois capitalism with bourgeois uh, liberalism and um, Mill's harm principle given the capitalists the benefit of the doubt and that they um, they were always uh, acting in accordance with Mill's harm principle it's inescapable or inevitable for them to eventually through the logic of capitalism excusing whatever outcomes at every corner uh, to send hundreds and thousands if not millions of the members of the working class to their slaughter but even before this eventuality just the the inequality the gulf between the classes that I mentioned this is continuously undermining the position of the working class in terms of their capacity to pursue their own good in their own way even if the nominal wage stays the same although it will always be sought to be lowered but if it if it reached a, a bottom threshold that cannot be um, transcended the, the least that can be paid and people are finding that they can just scrape a living from this and um, even if that stays the same the more the more that wealth I mean the wealth will keep accumulating the surplus value will keep keep um, it, it keep on up in terms of its upper distribution and um, the prices the cost of of material goods will alter um, keeping wages the same means that the working class are pushed further and further away from the material resources that anyone needs in order to practice individualism to practice um, the bourgeois liberalism to, to pursue their own good in their own way so looking at situating Mill's harm principle alongside capitalism we see that capitalism is the thing that deprives us from pursuing our own good in our own way and it's no doubt the intention of Mill um, and his philosophy to, you know, to outline the, the mental conceptions of the world that will allow, or the optimal conceptions of the world that will allow um, the individual to flourish. But in the context of possessive individualism and capitalism, we see that the, the possibility of doing this is a... Uh, thoroughly constricted at least for the majority of the people and it consigns humanity um, to a constant and often violent struggle with itself so how might we articulate or re-articulate Mill's harm principle in a way that might allow individuals to flourish more in a more universal sense um, two things the first is we need to recognize that possessive individualism is a patently incorrect position to take um, and uh, we need to recognise the um, the context and people's backgrounds and um, and how societal factors um, determine the outcome of individuals, and also that capitalism is a compulsion that binds us to to sort of to a constant struggle with ourselves, and is no form of emancipation at all. 
there can be no free individuals under capitalism as it as it constantly undermines the position of the working class, the material position, um, and pits the capitalist class in, like I said, constant and often violent struggle with itself. The second thing to do then is to um, is to like after once we've recognised that set of critiques is to articulate social obligations in a way that transcends possessive individualism um, you know to to instill another a new social norm alternative to neoliberalism and you know whatever term is given to the thing that replaced social solidarity so with possessive individualism it, it, like it is a nonsense to ignore people's conditions and circumstances uh, in relation to their outcomes in life and their well, I mean when I say outcomes I mean that in the, in the immediate sense um, how their life is outcame in that given moment and to do so in order to recognize that if that we want we want individuals to flourish in the universal sense and not in the sense of groups of one class over another and it's not near, merely to um, extend this consideration to others but that they might extend them to you. Neither is this a moral nor ideational consideration but um, one based on the material uh, requirements for a socialist mode of production whereby each individual um, works according to their ability and what is taken for consumption from what's produced is based on human need and not merit or endeavour as it is under capitalism. Um, both both of which are conditioned, uh, as I've been arguing throughout, by societal factors and things that are beyond the reach of many many individuals. And this act, this act is one of social solidarity. And decoupling consumption from production in this way is a um, implies a recognition for a wider social obligation than we can have under possessive individualism. It forms the basis for a a human material context whereby individuals um, free from the imposition of the compulsion of capitalism um, regardless of the class uh, where those individuals are sort of where their base material needs are met and are therefore free then to explore and express their own individuality and to flourish to pursue their own good in their own way. It's a recognition that to consume as an individual we must produce uh, socially and to be fair to capitalism you know reading Marx um, he admires capitalism for its socialization of production but um, critiques it for its limitations in terms of handing that socialized process over to the actual producers of wealth the people making things on the factory line. So returning to Mill's Harm Principle one final time um, we see that this sort of re-articulation is similar um, just in a far more fundamentally enhanced um, way where the social responsibility um, to one another is recognized and the obligation that we have to one another in terms of <clears throat> allowing any given individual to pursue their own good in their own way and I think in its historic context and how it manifested Mill's harm principle is a, is a sort of a negative interpretation of the possibilities of liberalism in that <clears throat> and I don't mean conservative in terms of the tradition of conservatism but it's a conservative interpretation in that it um, fo focusing on the individual in the way that it does it's just sort of renders its second clause as somewhat obsolete while if we focus if we recognize those societal factors and focus on that second clause um, we find it enhanced in a, or articulated in a far more positive way um, that allows each individual the, the basic material requirements to um, to go out and do those things stated in the first clause. And that's that for today.
We really hope you enjoy our podcast and appreciate critical as well as supportive comments. Thank you for dropping by and please do hit like, subscribe or whatever other button of appreciation you can find. Hit all of them and go on hitting them. Thank you a million.